Well, welcome, Vineyard Community Church. Glad that you're joining us online. Any of those who uh, are new to our church, we're glad that you're joining us as well. Uh, happy Easter. Uh, and uh, these are odd times, right? Interesting times that we're living in with uh, the COVID-19. You know, we're getting a lot of advice from the CDC telling us to do different things, uh, whether it's to wash our hands every half hour, uh, you know, make sure you're washing for 20 seconds, or coughing, or sneezing into our elbow, or, or using hand sanitizer all the time, wiping things down. Uh, now recently, right, it's wear a mask, even if you leave for, you know, to go to the, to the grocery store. Uh, I, I, I wondered what, is, what is something that you're struggling with regarding that? Maybe in the dialogue box, right, to the chat, say out of those things that the CDC is recommending, uh, what are one of the challenges? Maybe you can share a little bit about that. Let me tell you about one of mine is with the mask. I mean, I haven't worn a mask since I was a kid at Halloween. And so, you know, wearing a mask is certainly odd. It's not really part of our culture. So I throw on my mask and I go shopping two days ago. And the point of the mask, right, is you can't touch it. If you touch it, that now that contamination goes everywhere else. And so I'm trying to remind myself, don't touch the mask. Don't touch the mask. Next thing I know, it's falling down. I got to touch it to put it up. And then I have an itch that won't go away. I got to scratch it. And I end up touching it like 10, 15 times. Super frustrated. I'm thinking, why am I even wearing the mask? So I'm trying to figure that out. So maybe you have a story like that. What is one of the challenges that you have regarding some of those CDC uh, recommendations and dialogue a little bit about that uh, right now, if you would, in your dialogue box, in your chat box. Out of all of the recommendations, if you could only do one, they actually, there is one that stands above all the others. They say if you, th that there's one that is an absolute must, and that is social distancing. I mean, probably you all know that, right? That's why the governor, Northam, has put on a two and a half month stay at home uh, ruling for all of us. And governors all over the country have done the same type of thing, those kinds of, of social distancing efforts. They're saying that if you meet in a group, you should meet no more than 10. That's certainly put a lot of strain and difficulty on, on, on our lives. Uh, people that uh, have had weddings planned, have had to reschedule them. We had a funeral recently that only 10 people could be there, even though they were and, you know, loved by so many other people and they can't be there, they can't be part of that. Uh, there's graduations that got, uh, they couldn't get rescheduled. Graduation ceremonies were just canceled. Proms were canceled. People, w girls had to take back their dresses and, or, or you can't take back the dress. I mean, all of the challenges that come with it, sports events, I mean, are canceled and then the sporting world, we're watching football or we're watching basketball from years past and all the challenges with that. People can't see their doctor, people can't see the dentist and they have problems with their teeth and it's causing a lot of havoc and it's putting a fair amount of challenge on the church. The church uh, has had to meet online the last few weeks and we actually crashed the internet two weeks ago, which is kind of funny because so many people were online right during that time on the Sunday morning hour. And here we are, Easter, we're meeting really the first time ever in history all over the world, not just the nation, all over the world meeting online and not in a physical location. You know, we're just all over. So it's not the church gathered, but the church scattered. What's interesting though is if you go back all the way back to the very first Easter, you'll find an interesting dynamic that you might not be aware of. Did you know that the very first Easter, that it happened in a home, in a room, in seclusion? They were actually in self-quarantine, a lot like what we're going through right now. And so there's some lessons that we can learn from that first Easter. You see these guys that are together in this room and uh, the, 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 we don't know a lot about the room. Here's what the Bible says. It says, it's a large, fully, un, fully furnished upstairs room. So it's, a, it's an upper room, a room upstairs, fully furnished. We don't know a whole lot about that. The room is no longer there today. There was another structure built on the ruins called the Seneca. And, uh, and that's where the Last Supper was, was held. So where that famous uh, uh, painting of the Last Supper, that was... That's, that's where that would have happened, even though the painting, of course, was over a thousand years later. There is a, a, a meme about that painting of the Last Supper 
where what it would look like in the days of the coronavirus with Zoom. And uh, here's the meme. It's Jesus is by himself and everybody's zoomed in, you know, trying to participate in the meal. Well, obviously that's not how it happened, but kind of funny. But what did happen, what is interesting about that is, is that uh, we can, like I said, we can learn a lot about what, not just that meal, but kind of what happened with that whole event for the Easter time. They were secluded, self uh, quarantined for 50 days. It's kind of a, not just, we often we think of Easter as like one day or a weekend. It's the first Easter was stretched over 50 days long and it happened around these group of people that were secluded. They were in self quarantine and we can learn some lessons. One of the things we learn is about serving. Serving when we're together, when we're cl- connected real close to people and we're, and we're seeing them all the time, there's opportunities to serve. And that certainly happened with uh, Jesus and the disciples who were in this room. Jesus sends these guys to the room, actually two of them, uh, Peter and Peter and John. He says, I want you to go before the rest of us. I want you to set up the room. I want you to prepare a meal for the Passover meal. They were Jewish and they were celebrating the Passover feast. And that meant go get a lamb. You're going to address the lamb. You're going to roast it. All of the stuff that went along with that, the you know the the wine, the the the, the bread, set the place up. It also included washing the people's feet who come in, making sure that there was somebody there to do that. So they didn't have somebody. There wasn't an additional person to wash people's feet. So it fell on them, fell on Peter or John to wash their feet. So the time came for them to have the meal. And they, John and Peter, they don't want to wash the feet. And so certainly that's a challenge, right? It's a, it's a challenge of, of serving, I mean, it, it's the, the lowest job. These, they, they, back in those days, they wore like Birkenstocks, right? They're walking on dirt roads. They don't bathe very often. Certainly their feet would have been dirty and stunk. And uh, it's, I mean, it's a, it's a low job. It's a lowly job. They, and, they, and not only that, they're having to wash the feet of their peers. I mean, is there anything harder than that? You know, they're, they're kind of their peers they're jostling with all the time. And, and, uh, and so they didn't do it is what, it, what happened. And so Jesus... He does it. He decides he's going to demonstrate what servanthood looks like, particularly in a place of close proximity of seclusion. So he goes ahead, he takes off his robe, puts on a towel, and he washes their feet. It says, Jesus longed to show them the full measure of his love. So he got up from the meal and took off his outer robe and took a towel and wrapped it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' dirty feet and dry them with his towel. So Jesus demonstrates uh, this, this place of serving, something that he, it's a lesson we can learn because we'll have lots of opportunity uh, to do that. You see, Peter didn't want his feet washed. When Jesus got to him, he goes, no, Jesus, I'm, I'm not going to let you do it. Jesus says, I have to do it. This is part of what I want to want you want you to learn, not only to serve, but to be served and, and how that interchange happens. But he didn't want to do it because he didn't want Jesus to wash his feet because he had he had dropped the ball, right? He was supposed to do it. It's his job and he didn't do it. Uh, has that ever happened to you where you know you were supposed to you were supposed to do something, it was expected you do it, and um, and you don't do it, and then you're kind of embarrassed about the whole thing. Well, that happened to me just two weeks ago. Sharon and I uh, took Bella on a walk in First Landing State Park. And it's, I usually try to make it my job, and, and, and I'm good about it, of bringing a, a, a plastic bag in case uh, the dog poos uh, you know, on, on the trail or wherever we're walking. Well, I forgot this time. And so Bella, she poos, and so we're in the we're in the state park. So I just go get a stick, and I kind of flicked it all into the off to the side of the pathway. Well, I, evidently I missed a piece. I didn't realize that. And so a lady, and it, she's got a stroller and two kids walking next to her. She goes by us, and evidently the stroller rolls right over one of the pieces of poo. About ten feet in, uh, past us, she stops, and she's really really angry and she looks back at us like if you did this you're lower than well dung you know I mean just like and I was so embarrassed I just I didn't even own up to it I just kind of just sheepishly thought well it's time to go you know I mean I just I I just got tongue-tied I don't know I mean it's not my finest hour you know but 
But uh, this is what Peter's experiencing. You know, I mean, he was supposed to do that. And now Jesus has got, you know, this, this towel around his waist. He's on his knees. He's going around. He's washing. He's doing the most humbling job of all. Now, Jesus is not trying to humiliate them. He's trying to demonstrate how important serving is. Peter didn't deserve his feet uh, to be washed. Uh, Judas Iscariot was still there at that time. He didn't deserve his feet washed. He was going to betray Jesus in just a few hours. But Jesus does it, and he does it with joy. And here's what he says. He says, If I am your teacher and Lord and have just washed your dirty feet, then you should follow the example that I have set for you and wash one another's feet. Then he says, put into practice what I have done for you. And notice this, you will experience a life of happiness enriched with untold blessing. He's talking about, hey, when we serve with the right attitude, our life starts to change. We fill, our heart fills up with joy and, we, and, and, and our relationships start to change. It really does change everything when we learn to serve other people. When I was leaving out of the house for good, uh, I was leaving from my dad's house, I was 18, and he said, son, when you, if you wanna get along with your roommates, here's the trick. He goes, you do 110% and expect nothing in return. Well, when he said that, I thought, well, that doesn't sound right. I mean, that doesn't sound fair, but it, I, I did use his advice and it helped me a lot in my roommates. In fact, I discovered that actually helps in marriage as well. That, you know, you just, you're there to serve, Try not to look for a lot in return. If you are, if you get, then you're surprised. Hey, that's great. That's exciting. And, uh, and, and learning to serve. When Sharon and I uh, got married 31 years ago on April 8th, we just celebrated 31 years this past Wednesday. 31 years ago, we asked our, our, uh, our pastor who was officiating the wedding, he goes, well, do you want me to talk about a particular verse? And we said, oh, yes. Oh, yes, we were very clear. Immediately we knew we want you to talk about John 13, about Jesus washing the disciples' feet. You go, why didn't you pick a, a verse on love? My friends, that is a verse on love. When we serve other people and we do it with joy, that's one of the most loving things that we can do. So that's one of the lessons certainly that we see from their time of seclusion, but it's just day one, right? And also on day one, we find they had very meaning, a very meaningful meal, which was the Passover meal. They didn't just race through it. They, and, and, and they spent a time talking about, uh, talking together, not just about the meal. I mean, I mean, it's not because they had watched a YouTube on Gordon Ramsay on how to make an amazing roasted lamb. No, they wanted to have meaningful relationships together. And particularly by Jesus, he was driving this because he had been thinking about it. He even says that, I've been pondering, I've been thinking about this meal and how uh, we can spend it together. Not just the actual meal, but the conversations that went around it. Easter is about serving joyfully. We looked at that. When Jesus arrived at the upper room, so they're still in this upper room, he took his place at the table along with all the apostles. Then he told them, he says, I have longed with passion and desire. In other words, he's been thinking about it. I've been, I've been longed with passion and desire to eat this Passover lamb with you before I endure my suffering. So he knows what's coming, but he's been thinking about it. And it's pretty remarkable what he shares. When you read this, one of the, it's really the longest discourse we have of Jesus, uh, other than the Sermon on the Mount, they're about the same length. We have from John 13 to John 17, four chapters of Jesus pouring out his heart. I mean, he's really opening up. He's talking about how he feels. He talks about how it feels to, he knows he's going to be betrayed and how that's going to feel. And the pain of that. He, you know, he opens up some, he's vulnerable in his conversation. He talks about his concern for their faith, that they might, uh, they, they don't necessarily know all that's coming their way, that they might fall away. And he's concerned about that. He talks about the promise of the Holy Spirit, how the Spirit of God can come into their lives and give them comfort when they're in pain, give them strength when they're in trouble, uh, that the Holy Spirit will be there to be an advocate for them, to help them to know how to, how to speak with confidence. He, he covers a number of these things. He talks about what it is to be a good friend and have great friendships. 
He talks about what it means to love and to have manly love and, to, and what that looks like and, and uh, not just what the culture says. And he talks about loving being, uh, laying your life down for somebody and, and caring for them and, you know, more than yourself. He talks about uh, conflict in relationships and how to resolve that. And, and then he ends it by praying out loud. He's not afraid to pray out loud with, his, with the people that he cares about. And that's the context of making a meal meaningful. Now, you and I both know that with two and a half months of stay-at-home orders, stay-at-home rules, we have a lot of opportunity to have meals together. Now, we can, we can go the other way. We can just, you know, muscle memory, just do what we've always done. Everybody does their own thing. Uh, that, it's, it, it's not natural because it's hard to now uh, eat out and do your own thing. It, we tend to be at home because we're being asked to be at home. And so my, my, what I'm going to suggest you to do, particularly if you're a parent and you have younger kids at home, I'm going to ask you to, to set aside a night a week, preferably more, you know, two, three nights a week, where you tell your kids up front, hey, these nights we're going to have meaningful conversation. And so we're going to you know, not have the TV on. We're going to ask you to not bring your cell phone to the table. This is going to be a time where we, where we eat and we talk. And then come prepared. You know, what I've discovered is important things takes intentionality. If I'm not intentional about it, often those things get, you know, get, they don't happen. They get pushed off into the back burner. And so come prepared. Be prayerful about that. Maybe you could even use Jesus' discourse in uh, John 13 through 17 as a template. You know, talk about friendships. Talk about some stuff that's vulnerable in your life that maybe some things you've gone through. Talk about how much you love them. Talk about how much God loves them. And then share your story. Look for an opportunity to be able to talk about your own faith story. Listen, if you're a parent, your children should be able to hear and know your own faith walk and your story and how you found faith. That's important. That's part of who you are. It's a big part of who you are. And so mealtimes can be that expression. It can be a very powerful time. Easter is about meaningful mealtimes. We see that from the first Easter when they were in seclusion. Of course, that's day one. But it continues on, the lessons that they learn. And we can, we can see that as well. Now, we go into to, to, to speed up to day four to get there, of course. Uh, after this meal, Jesus and the disciples go to the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, Judas betrays him. Jesus ends up going, being falsely accused, being tried. He's, he's uh, beaten. He's crucified. He, he is then put in the tomb. And then for three days, he lays in the tomb. And then on the third day, he rises again. And that's what we celebrate with Easter, right? That's the apex. That's the climax of the story of Easter, that Jesus raises from the dead. And it is. It is absolutely that. For the disciples, though, they're actually still in seclusion. They're in their own self-imposed stay-at-home order because they're afraid of, they saw what happened to Jesus. They're afraid. Uh, but they're there. They're in seclusion, just in many ways like we are. And Easter happens for them when Jesus shows up in their room, in where they're at. It says, that evening, the disciples gathered together, and because they were afraid of reprisals from the Jews' leaders, they had looked, locked the doors to the place where they met. So in other words, they're, they're in this place of seclusion still. But suddenly, Jesus appeared among them and said, peace be with you. So Jesus is in his glorified body. Uh, when we die, Jesus says that the, our bodies will be resurrected uh, at, the, at the day of resurrection. And you say, well, how's that? You know, what, what if you're cremated? How's that work? With, well, it's going to be a glorified body. It won't be of the same substance. Uh, Jesus uh, just would, could appear. But notice he was recognizable. So you're, you will be recognizable. It says, peace, peace to you. And it says, then he showed them the wounds of his hands and his side. They were overjoyed to see the Lord with their own eyes. So here uh, Jesus shows up and renews their faith. They were in a place where they had lost all hope. They had thrown everything in. I mean, they sold the, the, the farmhouse and the farm, the whole thing, to follow Jesus. And they had been with him for over three years. And, and then it all just ended. I mean, it just, they just saw it just vanish before their eyes. They had no hope. They were, they were looking at a future that was, that was they didn't know what it would look like. Uh, they, might, they might end up 
you know, being killed, anything could happen. And Jesus shows up in the middle of that and then renews their hope. Doesn't that speak to our situation? I mean, here we have a global virus, a pandemic that's ravaging nations and it's coming our way. You know, the cases keep going up and nobody knows, will there be treatment? Will there be a vaccine? How long will it take? And, and, uh, and, then, and then on the other side of this, will, will you have a job? Will, what will it look like? What will anything look like? What, I mean, it, certainly this is going to change a lot of things for us. And, and obviously some of the change could be disconcerting. There's a lot of things to be concerned about. And honestly, some of you had concerns before the coronavirus and still have those concerns like, will I find a job that's meaningful to me? Will I find a job that's fulfilling? Will I find a relationship that's meaningful? Will I find intimacy in my life? Well, some of you are, are worried about, you know, can I have a child? Some of you are concerned about, uh, you know, some dream that you had. You know, will that dream ever happen? And and listen, when you, in, when you live in that place for long enough, it can get pretty, pretty dark, pretty, pretty lonely, pretty, pretty scary. So Easter is about God coming into your life, renewing your hope, reinvigorating that vision that God is here for me. Easter is about hope for the future. You don't have to go into your future without hope. That's part of what happens when God encounters you. You know, it's interesting that when Jesus shows up in this room, just appears, there's only 10 disciples at that point. Now, I'm not sure if that's where the CDC got their idea to have 10, but, uh, you know, and my, maybe they did. Who knows? But uh, for, they had, there was only 10 because Judas Iscariot had betrayed Jesus and had hanged himself. Thomas, he's gone. We don't know why. Maybe he's on an errand. Maybe everybody, you know, they drew straws and he had to go get the, the case of beer or something. But Thomas isn't there. Anyways, he comes back and Jesus is gone by then. And so Thomas is discouraged. Thomas says, hey, wait a minute. And they're all pumped. They're all excited. That's not enough for him. And he goes down as doubting Thomas for years and years. I mean, that's still a phrase people use today. Oh, don't be a doubting Thomas. That's where it comes from. You know, that he was the doubter. Why? Well, as excited as they were, as convincing as they were, as jubilant as they were, it just didn't, it, it didn't hit him. He missed that. You know, that he got, he got, a bad deck of cards, you know, given to him, you know, and so he's in a tough place. And so here's, it says, eight days later, the disciples were together again. And this time Thomas was with them. So it's eight days later, not the next day, not two days later, eight days after that, then Jesus shows up. The doors were locked. So here they're in the same room. And suddenly, as before, Jesus was standing among them and greeting them. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger in my hands put your hand in my side don't be faithless any longer believe you see for thomas easter was a time to rediscover his faith he had lost his faith he had gotten off track he had veered off kind of went into a place where he was doubting i mean he he was just basically saying i need something major to happen for me because i i don't see it i don't feel it but easter is about christ coming and doing something in your life and, 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 and rediscovering your faith. He wants, to re, he wants to give you that hope again. He wants to pour into your life uh, a, a life that's, that's abundant and full of life and to, to follow him. And all of that happened, I want to say, while they were in seclusion. Now, as I said, the seclusion goes for 50 days. So I wanted to speed up. There's some other things that happen. Uh, they, they, it, but as it gets to the day 50, they start praying. They start, God, the real sense of anticipation, God's going to do something. And he does. On day 50 of their seclusion, which ends up being their last day of seclusion, uh, there's some extra people there by then. Uh, so they're filling up the home. It's not just the upstairs room. It's the whole home. And God shows up in power. So Easter is about rediscovering faith. But then here it is, 50 days later, it says, suddenly a sound like a violent blowing wind came from the sky and filled the whole house. See, it's the whole house now where they were staying. Tongues that looked like fire appeared to them. The tongues arranged themselves so that each one came to rest on each believer. In other words, God visited each person individually. His presence was there with them. 
all the believers were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them the ability to speak. So here's this amazing experience that, that they had. Now, let me just say, it might not always look like that for you. I mean, for Moses, he had a burning bush. For Gideon, he had a fleece. For Paul, it was this experience on the Damascus Road. I mean, God does all kinds of things in order to reach us, to connect with us. But ultimately, He wants you to be filled with His presence. He wants you to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And notice, it does, I love this. I'm going to end with this verse here. It says, for God's promise of the Holy Spirit is for you. So even though that happened in the very first Easter over 2,000 years ago, he goes, it's for you and your families, for those yet to be born, and for everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. God says that promise is for you. That promise is an Easter promise for today. So Easter is about experiencing God's presence in seclusion, in their time of self-imposed, stay-at-home, shelter-in-place. God did some amazing things in their lives. He taught them about serving with joy, and He taught them about having meaningful meals. He talked to them about having a hope for the future, rediscovering their faith, and then experiencing God's presence for themselves. That is my prayer for you, that you would experience those five things today and throughout these days of, of being in seclusion in our homes. Okay, let's pray. Father, come Holy Spirit. Lord, we just pray right now in Jesus' name for you to fill this place, not just where I'm at right now, but in every place where somebody's viewing this, watching, joining, we know, Lord, that the church is not a place, not a facility. It's the whole, it's wherever the Spirit of God is, that's where your presence is and that's where the church is. And so, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you do something miraculous. You start to change things. Things don't need to be the way they were. There's some things that do need to be shaken up. And so, Lord, we invite you to come and do those things. First of all, Lord, I pray for those who struggle with serving, which is probably all of us, and those who struggle with serving with joy, that they would step into that role. This is a time to really build bridges, to really love on people, love on them in a practical way, people that maybe we take advantage of or take for granted. Lord, help us to be people that take the high road and, and, and look for opportunities to serve and to serve with joy. And Lord, I also pray for our mealtimes that we would have opportunities, not every meal, that's way beyond what we would expect, but Lord, we pray that for some of the meals, that they would be meaningful, that we would be intentional about it. Lord, I pray for parents, particularly, that have younger kids still at home, that they would think through and have meals that would be significant and meaningful, that they would share from their heart, maybe their own faith story, maybe some of their own struggles. They would do it age appropriately, of course, but Lord, just give them courage. I know it takes a lot of courage to, to be a parent and step into that and to share about what real love and real friendship is like. Lord, I pray for your, your patience for them. Give them the ability to walk in that. All of us, Lord, help us to have more meaningful experiences in our meal times. And Lord, I pray for, for um, a rediscovery of hope, that hope for the future comes into our hearts. Lord, I pray for particularly some of you. You have had canceled things. You've had things that you can't get back. And uh, difficult circumstances that you're working through right now and have been, really. And Lord, I pray that you would bring hope. And that really can happen through when we turn to you. To turn and look to you and say, God, what do you want to do in this? We know, God, that you will never waste a pain. You'll never waste a hurt. We bury them. We gnaw on them. We, we, we do all kinds of stuff. But when we give them to you, you use them in a redemptive way to make, uh, to make something good come out of that. And so, Lord, I pray for those who are in a place they need hope, that you give that to them. And Lord, I pray for those who are needing to rediscover their faith. Some of you, that's you. You're there. You're, you need to take this first step of saying, you know what, I, I want to follow God, or maybe just follow God again like Thomas. I'm back, I want to be back in. This is what this Easter is all about. 
If you or if that's you, you you're far from God, you're saying, I want to come home, I want to follow God, then I'm going to invite you to pray with me right now. To say, Holy Spirit, Lord, I want to I want you to fill my heart. Would you pray that prayer? Lord, give me hope again for the future. Would you say, God, forgive me my sin. Forgive the things when I just raise my fist at you and want to do things my own way. Lord, make my heart more soft. Make my mind more open to spiritual things and things of you. Would you say, God, fill me with your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, the Lord bless you. I'm so glad that you are joining us and being part of what we're doing. This is really an amazing time when we let God use it, when we let God use it. We certainly want to do that. Okay, if you prayed with me or you have a prayer request, I want to know from you. We have, for those of you who are on our, uh, our website software, uh, there's a place for you to click on there and say, I'd like some prayer. We have a prayer team. Uh, that goes to a private prayer uh, experience for you. If you ask Christ into your life, you said, I want to commit my life to Christ this Easter. I want to know about that. And there's a place for you to, to indicate that as well, where you say, I committed my life to Christ. I prayed that prayer with, with Andy. Uh, if you're on Facebook with us or, 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 or YouTube or Vimeo or one of the other ways, certainly we'd love to see your comments. You can always direct message us. We'd love to hear from you and pray for you as well. Please let us know how you're doing. Well, thank you again for coming to our, uh, being part of our service. If you'd love to give and be part of what we're doing here, and uh, particularly to our COVID-19 uh, budget, we're helping to, uh, the families in our church as well as families in our communities. We're giving them food and we're helping them with their bills and all kinds of things. We'd love to have you to help support with that. The way that you can do that is just text your gift to 45777. And then in the, uh, in the, in the, place where you put in the money amount. Just put in VCC, that directs it to us, and then and then the amount that you want to give, okay? Uh, other ways to give, of course, is vineyardchurch.com, as well as uh, the check through either old-fashioned or online giving. However you want to do it, we'd love to have your support, but I'm so glad that God's doing something in your life, and I'm thankful that you joined us. Have a great Easter, and let God do something amazing during this time in our lives, okay? I'll see you next week. God bless. Hey, man, thank you for joining us today. I hope you have more peace and some more joy today yes. after that message. And um, hey, at the end of the message, you should have saw, if you was watching on Vineyard, on the website, hey, I committed my life to Jesus. Yeah. We want to know about that. We Click do, that yeah. button, okay? God is, man, was speaking to you. Let's do it. And if you're on Facebook as well, uh, send us a private message. Let us know you made that amazing decision so we can give you some next steps. Yeah, because we believe that's the most important decision you can ever make with your life. Hey, if you call Vineyard your home, uh, we just want to let you know that you can still give even though we're not here physically. If you're on the church online platform, there's a giving button, or you can go to our website, vineyardchurch.com, or even texting to give, 45777, and just text VCC plus the amount. But hey, we also want to pray for them, right, Daniel? Yeah, let's pray, man. How can we do that? How can they send us their prayer requests? So you can go to uh, vccprayers at gmail.com. Yeah. You can just send us an email. That's the email address, vccprayers at gmail.com. Um, hey, it's on our website at vineyardchurch.com. Send us an email. We want we have a team of people waiting to pray for you, Come ready on. to lift you up, yeah. ready to encourage you. So let us know. Yeah, and you can even, if you're on the church online, you can click prayer and get immediate prayer right now yeah. um, if, if you need that. But hey, stay connected with us throughout the week. The church building may be closed, but, but we know the church isn't closed, right, right Daniel? Right, that's so, right. So hey, follow us on social media, at Vineyard VA, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, um, and subscribe to us on YouTube as well um, to kind of just stay updated, stay connected with us. Yes. Um, we're so excited that you joined us. And that's hey, right. we do this every week, right, Daniel? That's right, every weekend. We're here for you. Come on. We are the church. Yeah, so we'll see you next week. All right.